This is the second lecture in the skeletal system. In this lecture, we're going to look more at um, some of the structure of bones and places where bones come together. So in, with bone structure, we've talked a little bit about these parts, but it's important to understand the two different kinds of bone that are found within one complete bone itself. Um, we have the compact bone, which is sort of the first layer under the periosteum. The compact bone, as you might expect, is very, very dense and therefore compact. The cells are packed very tightly together and there is a high composition of minerals, things like calcium and phosphate and other minerals that provide um, both structure and strength. And because of the compact bone, the overall bone structure is very, very strong and it is resistant to bending, it's resistant to force, and it's able to handle um, much more shock and potential um, injury-causing forces. Inside the compact bone is a thick layer of spongy bone, and the name tells you pretty much exactly what it looks like. It's also, um, uh, the cell types are very similar, but they are much less closely packed, and so there are kind of pockets of space. Therefore, the spongy part of that name, it looks like there are holes within the bone, and that particular substance, that structure allows for the bones to be lighter weight. If the entire bone was made of compact um, matrix and minerals, your bones would be so heavy it would be virtually impossible to move around. Um, and the spongy bone at the ends, so within the diaphysis, the, the shaft of the long bones, there's the medullary cavity, but at the ends of the long bones, um, the spongy bone is pretty well filled with the red marrow for blood cell production. So now we're going to look at some of the bones themselves, and you will be working on learning a lot of these names. Um, we divide the skeleton into two parts. So here we've got kind of the midline, everything down the center. That's called the axial skeleton. So we're dealing with the skull, the spine, and then the rib cage itself. The skull actually, believe it or not, has 32 different bones. 18 of them are surrounding the brain and 14 of them are facial bones. There's seven on each side, one on, you know, seven on the left, seven on the right. Um, one bone that a lot of people don't even know exists is called the hyoid. It's found between the lower jaw and the throat. You can see that here. Um, and then we get to the vertebral column or the spine. And you have 26 total vertebrae. Um, they, this is starting from the skull and working your way down to the bottom. So the first seven are called the cervical vertebrae. The next 12 are the thoracic because they run along uh, your rib cage and chest cavity. The next five are lumbar or lower back vertebrae. And then the bottom two, we've got the sacrum, which is kind of the big um, triangular shaped part of the tailbone. And then the coccyx, which is kind of the curved piece at the bottom. Um, also, some bones that you may not be aware of. Within the ear, on each side, you have all three of these bones. So there are two types total. You have one malleus, one incus, one stapes in your left ear, and one of each in your right ear. They are the tiniest bones in the body. And then finally we have the chest bones, 24 ribs, and your one sternum right down the center. The other portion of your skeleton is called the appendicular skeleton. So this refers to everything that is off the midline, so basically all of the limbs of the body. So um, what you'll see is this term quite a bit, girdle, and that basically means to hold together. So the pectoral girdle is this structure here. It holds together the shoulder and it holds the arm to the body. So the pectoral girdle has, again, two of each of these bones, one on the left and one on the right. The clavicle is the collarbone and the scapula is the shoulder blade. And then within the arm, we have the humerus. So this is just showing on one side. This would be right the left side of the body. We have a humerus, the radius, which is the um, smaller of the two lower arm bones, the ulna, 
Then we have 16 wrist bones, eight on the left, eight on the right, um, 10 metacarpals, so again, five on the left, five on the right, and then 28 phalanx, or 28 bones that make up all of the parts of your fingers, 14 on each side. So, right, the word for finger is phalanges. Multiple phalanges are a phalanx, or make up the phalanx. Um, then we have a similar situation at the lower half of the body. We have the pelvic girdle. So this is the, these are the structures that make up your hips and then hold your legs to the body. So we have two hip bones, right? There's one and there's one, one on the left and one on the right. And then again, we have 60 bones in the lower leg, 30 per leg. Two femurs, two tibia, which is the longer, or not the longer, pardon me, the larger of the two lower leg bones. The two fibula, two patella or kneecaps. 14 tarsals, so seven per ankle, 10 metatarsals, five uh, foot bones per side, and then another 28 phalanx, so 14 toe bones on the left and on the right. So where all of these bones come together, we have um, spots called the joints. You will also see in a lot of our literature where these are called articulations. Um, they mean the same thing. It's just ref referring to places where we have at least two bones meeting in the same location. It can be way more than two, but at least two. So there are three basic joint types. The first one is fibrous joints. And remember that fibrous refers to a dense connective tissue. So this is a joint that has a really dense tissue holding the bones in place. Um, so the skull is a really good example of this. I told you back to a couple slides ago that the skull has 18 different bones, right? All held together. Those are held together at joints that are called sutures because the, the connective tissue basically kind of sews those bones in place and essentially allows for no movement whatsoever, right? When you um, are in the process of doing anything, your skull bones are not shifting position. That would be I mean, maybe kind of cool, but also very odd. Um, the next type are cartilaginous. So that gives you a pretty good indication of what holds those joints together. They're held together by cartilage, specifically fibrocartilage. And these are um, also fairly rigid joints. So these are locations like the between the vertebrae. So again, you've got all those vertebrae running from the bottom of the skull all the way down to the pelvic girdle. And they have very limited motion. You can bend forward, you can shift sort of side to side, you can bend backward somewhat, but the, there's not a lot of other motion allowed there. Um, the sternum and the rib is another example. The joints that we tend to think of are what we call synovial joints, and they are the ones that allow for much more motion and allow for the movements that we are we generally think of when we think of motion. So the way that synovial joints are set up, remember that at the ends of our long bones, so kind of at this location, the bones there are wrapped in cartilage. That cartilage provides for some protection from the, the bones rubbing against one another, but then the joints are even further protected. So they have um, this fluid, in this picture, the fluid's kind of this bluish structure. This fluid is called synovial fluid, and it acts sort of like WD-40 on a hinge. It is um, very slippery and um, not very viscous, which means it flows pretty easily. And it, it just keeps those bones more lubricated. So again, as they're moving past one another all the time, they're not grating or grinding or wearing away the bone. In really high pressure, um, lots of shock joints like the knees, for example, there will be an even additional structure in here. It looks sort of like a little pillow called the meniscus. Multiple meniscus are menisci. Um, and those are little like cartilage pillows that provide even more shock absorption between the bones and um, have synovial fluid all around them. 
In some other joints, we also see bursa, um, like the elbow, for example, has a what's called a sac, a blue, blah, pardon me, a bursa, which is a fluid-filled sac that serves the same function as the meniscus. It provides additional shock absorption and um, prevents contact between the bones as much as possible. And it helps to kind of lubricate the tendons where muscles are attaching to the bones at that joint. In this picture, we've got a picture, uh, view of the ligament as well and how it attaches the top bone to the bottom bone. So some examples of synovial joints. We're gonna kind of go from highest motion possibility to least motion possibility. So the joint with the most, the highest range of motion is called the ball and socket. We find these at the shoulder and the hip. And you can see that right here. Um, so the one bone in, let's say the case of the shoulder, the um, humerus has a rounded end, which is why it's called a ball. And then the shoulder joint acts as the socket. So if you rotate your arm around, make some big circles with your arm as you listen, you can see that you've got a lot of rotational motion. You can lift your shoulder or your arm up and down. You can lift it forward and backward. You can swing it round in big circles or little circles. You can kind of um, bend it across your chest and then out to the side. So you have a lot of motion there. The next type is called a condyloid joint. Um, this is where one bone has sort of an oval shaped end, similar to ball and socket, but not as pronounced. And it sits in, in a little kind of cave or cavity shaped end of another bone. So it allows for pretty good motion. It just doesn't rotate all the way around like your arm or your leg does in their socket. Um, so we find these at the joint between the hand and the fingers, where the fingers attach. So you can kind of, if you mess, you know, point your finger straight out and then lift it up and point it down toward your palm and then it can kind of go side to side, but it can't really swivel all the way around quite like your shoulder and hip do. Um, the next joint is a gliding joint and we find those at the wrist um, and at the ankle. So there are several flat um, short bones that tend to be kind of stacked near one another side to side and front and back and the gliding motion allows them to move past one another which allows for you to kind of point your hand up toward the sky and then down toward the floor and it can somewhat go side to side um, and it can somewhat rotate um, but again the motion is more limited than the ball and socket. The final three, um, the hinge joint we find this at the knee and at the elbow, and it's just like um, a door on your car, right? The door only opens one way. Same thing with your knee. It only bends one way. The elbow only bends one way. You can't bend your knee back. You know, you can bend it back and touch your ankle to your butt, but you can't bend it up and touch your, say, toes to your shoulder. That's just not the way the knee joint goes. And that's because one end of the bone is concave so it has built a little indentation and the other bone matches that shape but in the opposite way it's convex so it, it curves outward and so that allows for um, the convex bone to sit within the cave of the other bone and it allows for just that one type of motion just like the door on your car can only open in one direction. A pivot joint is what just what it sounds like. Pivot means to kind of turn or rotate. So this is a cylindrical or rounded bone that sits within a ring um, of another bone and is held in place by ligaments. So there's just one rotation of motion. If you put your arm out straight and put your palm facing up and your elbow, like your elbow joint facing up so that you know the whole inside of your arm is facing toward the sky. Then you just rotate your hand so now your palm is facing down but your elbow, um, the inside of your elbow is still facing up. You can see that pivot joint. The lower arm bones can rotate around one another um, but only in the one direction, right? You can't rotate your palm outward and so that it faces down. You can only rotate inward so that it faces down. Um, and then our last joint is called a saddle joint. If you think about how a saddle sits on a horse or a mule or whatever, um, that kind of gives you an idea of how the two bones and the saddle joint come together. So one has sort of a, um, a, 
an indented feature, but kind of at the middle of the bone, and the other has sort of a rounded edge so that the indented one can sit atop the other one, um, just like a saddle would sit on a horse. And that has a pretty good range of motion. Um, if you think about your thumb, right, This is there's a saddle joint between your thumb and your hand, so you can kind of open your thumb out and cross it across your palm, and it can come up and touch your fingers, but that's really it. It doesn't do a whole lot more than that. It doesn't really rotate around or do many of the other things that other joints can do. So that is it. That's the end of our lecture today. Please make sure that you write a summary with the highlights and most important details, and come in with some discussion questions for class, and I will see you then.